views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, it's nice to see you again. It's time for the Bronx Buzz. This is BronxNet's program where we talk to journalists, reporters, videographers, photographers, filmmakers, anybody involved in Bronx media, try and give you an idea of what they're thinking about, what they're talking about, uh, when they put things to pen to paper or type to digital or put it out. And um, that's uh, what we try to do every single week for you. This evening we have just an extraordinary program, two really exciting segments. And uh, the first segment, for the first segment, we're actually going down to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border all the way down to Laredo, Texas. And so let's get a report from uh, the uh, uh, aforementioned border from a longtime friend of mine and a longtime Bronxite, my friend Lois Haar, who is the Director of Campus Ministry and Social Action at Manhattan College. Uh, Lois, nice to talk to you. Hi, Gary. It's good to see you. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, why you are there in uh, Laredo, Texas. So a few months ago, I suppose, it occurred to me that work we were doing, I work at Manhattan College, as you mentioned. I was doing a lot of work with students um, to kind of educate them and do some advocacy on migration and immigration issues. And um, we were doing <clears throat> a lot on that and learning about the border and border issues. Some of my students went uh, to El Paso in um, January and did an immersion experience with one of my colleagues. And I thought, if I really want to know about this and maybe help the students learn about it, teach more about it, <clears throat> I ought to experience something myself for example. And then I came to know some folks you know, one, as they say, one thing always leads to another. Just friends I knew and people I knew, they had come here, and then that led me to find this particular, <coughs> excuse me, center is run by Catholic Charities in Laredo, Texas, and I, could, I connected with them, and then my husband, John Riley, and I came down together at the end of last week. So, um, now, uh, we hear stories, we see stories. You are not actually at the, uh, you know, at the border where... Uh, uh, children or families are being detained. Talk to me about the specifics of the place that you're at. Now, I know we have some photos, so let's put up that first photo, which kind of identifies where you are. Right. Uh, so actually, Gary, uh, I am at the border. Oh, okay. Uh, walk about, from my hotel, I could walk, I think it's about two blocks, um, and I would be at the Rio Grande River. So that is the border. Okay, <laughs> and fair enough. Very, you know, folks who live here and all around here would call the whole place La Frontera, the border, the borderlands. So um, it is the border, but we are, I'm in the United States, so there aren't detention centers right around here. Um, and people are coming to, coming across all different parts of the, the border. And here people seem to be coming, uh, actually kind of being sent as overflow from other places. And some people are trying to come across here, but that's a little more, I don't quite understand that, but I don't think they're coming really through Border Patrol auspices. They're sort of getting here on their own, and then they're really on their own. So that's a different issue. But the folks who are coming here, this is called the Rested Center. So these are people who've gotten to the point where they get to <clears throat> some Border Patrol folks, and they say, you know, I, I need asylum. I want asylum in the United States. And the first thing you have to prove um, I've been trying to read up on it, and folks here have explained it. Um, you have to have a credible fear. So, and usually that's about, could be group you're in, it could be gender, gender identity, the government can't really protect you uh, from various things like gangs and violence and extortion. Uh, so that's why so many, and then there's also 
a lot of people come in because of climate issues because they can't farm anymore. So, so you are kind of in a midway point where the Border Patrol police bring people to you and you try to outfit them with clothes or other um, munitions, as it were, that they need in order to kind of survive and, and just bef before or through the process of them being processed to see whether they can be granted asylum. Exactly. They, get, they have to have this credible fear, and they also have to have somebody in the United States who will buy them a ticket, a bus ticket, and, and accept them, receive them when they get where they're going. So, so far we've met people who are going to Atlanta, or Miami, some are just going as far as Houston, Texas, uh, Fresno, California, New York, um, really all over the states where their families are, their cousins, brothers, you know, aunts and uncles. Um, when they get here, they've been detained a little bit, uh, and then they need, they need a shower, they need water, they need to rest, they need to just, I mean, I'm dusty just being here myself, and I get to be in the shower, but folks who haven't had a shower for, you know, a week or right, so. Right, and also because... And, also because they've been walking or somehow traveling uh, through, uh, you know, S South American countries, for, could be from anywhere. Um, what, two-part question, what is their condition when they get to you? And what are they saying about why they're there and what their hopes and dreams are for coming across the border? Of course, they've been characterized a certain way. Uh, is there any indication from you that it's anything other than families who are really in need and not trying to game a system or take advantage. Well, that's really all I've seen um, so far, the folks who've come through here. I'd say altogether, I've seen probably over 100 people come through. And, you know, my Spanish is good old Bronx Spanglish. So I do get to talk to people a little bit, but not, not fluently. Um, and so I get a few stories. I asked one man um, what he does, and he was he, from Guatemala. And he said he, well, he did various jobs sometimes with agriculture, sometimes other jobs. And we had a little conversation about how farming was getting harder and it's because of climate change. And then uh, another man, I didn't speak with him directly, but someone here shared his story, you know, talked with him at great, greater length. Um, you know, he's from El Salvador, and his situation was that the gangs, were, he was a young man in his early 20s, and he was being pressed into the service, you could call it, with gangs, and um, he didn't want to do that. And they killed his mother. My and goodness. so, and threatened his family. So he decided he had to leave. So that's a pretty credible fear, but I, that's not, nothing untoward. He, in fact, he was trying not to be a bad guy, Gary. He was trying to be a good guy. And uh, he ended up. Have you seen people who have been separated from their children or from their um, either other relatives in, in a way that they would rather not have happened? Uh, I, you know, it have, to be really honest, I'm not sure. Everyone who's here is either mom with children or dad with children. In some cases, mom and dad. So I don't know if they were separated and then reunited. I'm not sure about that. Right. Um, could be that there are some, though, because it does seem to happen pretty indiscriminately. Let's uh, put up some of the pictures. Now, we saw the first one. Uh, there was another picture of a list. And so you have apparently spent a lot of time actually shopping to find stuff. Tell me tell me what uh, this this list is that we're looking at. Right. So, yeah, they, um, well, you figure people coming, um, they've had everything taken away from them at the border, pretty much except the clothes on their back, up to and including their shoelaces, uh, their belts, and their phones, and anything else they had. And they get their first set of paperwork, which they come here then in a kind of a plastic bag. Um, so they need everything. And so lots of people have donated things, really quite an extraordinary amount of, of goodness from people to give many things here that are needed. Everything, imagine everything, everything needs a toothbrush, a hairbrush. Right. You know. so but then every so realize there's a lot of something and not enough of something else. So we went to buy, we bought boys' belts, more hairbrushes. Um, and certain sizes of shoes, because Americans, U.S. Americans, seem to have bigger feet. So <laughs> okay. Just, um, uh, and, and I want to show some of the other pictures. Now, there are pictures um, of, of where some of these things are stored. Um, it's just uh, so we can put these up. And so here we're looking at this uh, photo of, uh, I guess, a storage room with uh, tons of bags. Tell me what this is. So, so people bring things and... Sometimes they're just in a big garbage bag, all mixed up, or in various forms, right? And right. so somebody starts sorting, 
So stuff comes into the donation room, that's kind of the first stop. <clears throat> and then it gets sorted into hopefully, you know, girls tops medium and women's things, this and, and then uh, and you go from room to room with, for different different things. So hygiene room, it's got all this stuff for like um, toothpaste and toothbrushes and soap and shampoo and things like that. And, right. Um, and uh, and you, you said in the short time that you've been there for two weeks? No, just I've been here since last Friday. So ab about a week. Um, and you've seen about 100 people. Do you get the sense that there are more people than uh, Border Patrol can keep track of? Oh, I think so. I mean, in fact, I'm not quite sure why we only saw 100 people, to tell you the truth, uh, because um, the, the folks who have been working here from the beginning have really set the place up and work for Catholic Charities are telling us that um, in the beginning, they would see 200 people in a day. Wow. So some things are going on with directives from Washington and what Border Patrol does and doesn't do, and the numbers seem to be changing very much. So one day we have 70 people, and then like some days it's been five people, and that's why together it's only about have, have you seen any of, uh, you know, kind of places where people have been detained? Uh, I mean, you know, we talk about it, we've seen the pictures on, you know, uh, the network news of cages and things like that. I uh, know I haven't. Okay. Um, I, I yeah. just just was asking. So let's run through a couple more of these photos um, uh, before we let Lois go. Um, and um, so here, I don't know. It looks like yarn or something. Oh, those are shoelaces. Oh, those are sh <laughs> at literally buying shoelaces. So, sorry. Fascinating. Yep. Uh, and yeah. and uh, now this uh, looks like another uh, a pack of stuff. I mean that people are. Um, is there is that the one with the young girl standing in the picture, right? Uh, oh, that's that's a, that's a trip back from. Uh, so we went one day. We went to Walmart and bought a lot of things, and then I, another day, another sense of a list of things we needed. Uh, we went with a, a woman who's been volunteering here. She's from Laredo, so right. she took us shopping in Laredo, and we right. went to little stores. And that's all that. Uh, Lois, um, you, you will be back in the Bronx uh, pretty soon. Uh, maybe we'll find another occasion to uh, get you to wrap up what, you're, um, uh, you know, what you've been doing. How, how would you wrap this up? What, what would be your words, I, I guess, to the Bronx, the people of the Bronx, who would be very curious as to what's going on there? How would you describe uh, you know, in total what your experience has been? Yeah, I, I would say that the picture we get is such a small portion of the whole story. And I don't know that I've seen the whole story. So I think we just have to keep looking and listening. And I would suggest to anybody who could come here and do it for a few days, that's the thing to do. Come and see for yourself and then think about things. And then go back and do some advocacy, you know, right. back in our, in our neighborhoods. Uh, maybe the thing to do would be for us to join you in your classroom once and watch and see how you describe uh, what you learned from uh, all that. Sure. Uh, okay. Lois Haar, of, uh, the uh, Director of Campus Ministry and Social Action at Manhattan College, thank you so much for sharing some of your experience. I'm sure you'll have more to tell us uh, as um, time goes on. And I know you will be back in the Bronx soon. We'll be happy to uh, greet you and welcome you warmly. And thank you for just volunteering and being with people who are in need. Thanks, Gary. All the best. You. Take care, yes. All right, we are going to uh, take a uh, short break, and then when we come back, change gears, and we're going to talk with uh, the uh, editor of City Limits. They have a whole new direction that will include an additional language in their publication. So let's take a short break. We'll be right back in the Bronx Buzz. Sure, I look cute now, but when my owner lost his job, it was rough. I was living on the street, and one night, me and this Cocker Spaniel got into it so bad, I wound up looking like an ice cream cone. I cried a little bit, but thankfully I got rescued, so I'm running, I'm jumping, all back to my old self, and I'm ready to give unconditional love, even if you put a lampshade on my head. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son. It's always worth it. Whoa, master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. 
We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. from Vivo's Do It Your Selfie, where we recreate the hottest looks from today's biggest music videos. After cleaning out our closet, we have a lot of clothes we don't wear anymore. Like this old t-shirt. It's not garbage, it's actually a brand new rug. And to make it, all you need to do is cut, tie, and glue. Cut the t-shirt into strips. Tie the strips into knots. And glue the knots to the bath mat. I love it. Give your garbage another life. And recycle. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz, and we're going to change gears totally and uh, take a look at um, what City Limits is doing. This is really, a, I, as I just expressed to our guest, who's on the phone in uh, Brooklyn over there, I just expressed to him that uh, th I think this is a really exciting project. So let's say hello to the editor of the Norwood, uh, uh, Norwood News. Sorry, no, the editor of City Limits. And um, <laughs> welcome my buddy Jarrett Murphy back to Bronx Talk. Nice to have you, my friend. Thanks, an avid reader of the Norwood yes, News I know. for 25 I, years, I, I was but, gonna, uh, but I, never an editor. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, being associated with that paper, you would accept that anyway, so that's all right. Yes, totally. Uh, honor, nonetheless, honor, um, so, so this whole idea, you put out an editor's note on citylimits.org of a, a second language that uh, for the first time you're having a, an article that will be published in Spanish. So why don't you talk to me about um, what you've done in the past in a second language, and then, of course, why we're leading up to kind of a new look at what the possibilities are. Absolutely, Gary. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. It is very exciting. You know, City Limits has been around since 1976, and up until a couple of years ago, everything we did, as far as I know, was in English. Um, and obviously, a lot of the people whose issues we write about, housing, criminal justice, education, English is not their first language, and for many of them, it's not a language that they are comfortable in if they if they can speak or write, read it at all. And so a couple of years ago, we being, began translating some material, a very limited amount, into Spanish. We also did a little Chinese in some neighborhoods. But more and more, I would be sitting at public meetings in the Bronx area where, as you know, both, both you and I live, and looking around and realizing that a lot of people in the room might benefit from reading our coverage, but we were not presenting it in a way that made it easy for them or even possible for them to read. So we are going to be hiring a Spanish language editor and reporter, um, and that is going to be a step toward creating a fully bilingual city limits, where we are producing original content in Spanish and English, cross-translating it, and trying to deliver to people not simply translated words, but a sense of how Spanish-speaking people see the city, the issues that matter to them, all the things that come with a perspective. Um, we hope to make that a regular part of our news operation starting very, very soon. Now, you know, the, you, you kind of touched on it, the issues that you deal with. I mean, you know, you have a whole housing uh, section, and, and I don't have to review all. I mean, you really are as grassroots as you could be with what issues are for Bronxites. And, and you just touched on it there. So do you think the content will be... Um, radically different from what you have done in English and you're just kind of translating it or even originating it in Spanish and then maybe it'll go back to English? Or do you think it really will open up kind of a new look and, and a whole kind of point of view shift uh, in, in terms of, you know, who uh, Hispanic people are and what their interests are? Um, you know, how do you view that? 
I suspect it's going to, that's a very good question, one we've been talking about a lot internally, and I think it's going to be kind of a mix of all those. I think that, you know, some stuff it's going to be essentially the same as if we had covered it in English. In some cases, we'll cover the same stories, but maybe it'll have a slightly different um, perspective um, or a bit of information or kind of sensibility that comes from having someone who's really rooted in that community and kind of can can talk to people who are being affected in their in their most comfortable language and then light in it. And then mm-hmm. I, I definitely am positive that there are going to be stories that come across our transom that we would not have detected otherwise, you know, things that are brewing in these communities um, that, you know, English-speaking reporters or even reporters who are Anglo or primarily English-speaking who can, who can speak Spanish um, have a harder time detecting. So I think it will be uh, all of the above, and I think that's part of what makes it exciting is that it's not just communicating to a new audience, which is always nice, but it's getting a whole, a whole sort of a whole new vein of news onto a website one way or the other. I, you know, and in a way, it will be in, uh, instructive to the people who work in the newsroom, to editors and people like yourself. You know, editors, uh, in a way, make have two sources of decisions. One is their own evaluation of what the world is or what their, uh, you know, their, their um, market is and, and what they think they need. And we've heard from you that you think that. Did you hear from people who said, you know, it's a real good story on gentrification, but we can't you know, fully communicate to people. So could you, may, you know, or did you hear from readers and, and others who said, you know what? Maybe you ought to do this. Or was this really something that you and, and people you work with said, hey, we ought to figure this out? I think it was really, it was more internal. I mean, we always get feedback in articles, and especially on complex stuff like gentrification, you know, whether you're speaking in English or Spanish or Russian, there are always perspectives that you miss and you could add. And we certainly get some of that feedback, some of it's friendly, some of it less so. Um, and we always have. This is more about saying, you know, we, we, we go through these periodic identity, identity crises in journalism. And for us, it's a question of, you know, what are we here for? Um, you know, we do investigative work, we cover the city, but there are other places that do that too. We like to see ourselves as a place that does deep reporting of and for working class New York, uh, outer borough neighborhoods like where I live in Norwood and where I'm been working recently in Bushwick. And that that's sort of what we do. And if you do that, you got to think about and the fact is that that audience uh, speaks a lot of different languages, but one primary one is, is Spanish. You know, there are 800,000 people in the city for whom English is not something they speak well and Spanish is their first language. That's, that's bigger than a lot of American cities. And trying to serve that population is, I think, a big part of what the city limits mission always has been and definitely what we see our role being in the next decades. You know, um, uh, the, the city is changing. You, anybody who looks at market statistics or demographics or, you know, um, a, any of that stuff, and certainly it'll be interesting to see what uh, the census ultimately uh, shows. Um, and, and in some ways, not only media, and, and you and I both in media, we put out a lot of, uh, you know, stuff that people are going to ingest. But I think even in basic communications, I've had um, d- dialogues with people in housing projects, and I said, you know, if you put it out in English, even if there are Hispanic people in your community who can read English, if you put it out in Spanish, there will be a comfort level, kind of an endorsement level that we are mm-hmm. part of this community. And, and that's why I just thought it was so exciting because it's saying, wait a minute, we know who you are. We know that you're out there. We know that this is your roots and we're with you, you know? And, and frankly, mm-hmm. I, I wish um, it was easier for more media to be as open-minded as that. Yeah, and, you know, I think there's a certain amount of personal skin in the game. You know, I, I've lived in the Bronx all basically my adult life. You know, I took Spanish in college. I was terrible at it. <laughs> I've never been very good at it. And now I've got to learn it. I simply have to because I'm going to be editing it. And so it's, I think it's partly about, you know, recognizing that, like, on a personal level, I need to make um, more efforts to communicate with my neighbors in the Bronx, which I love and where I've made my home. Um, and I think that, you know, especially given the, the larger political atmosphere we're operating in, I think that's an important thing for people to try to do if they can. And luckily, we've been given, because of New York Community Trust's um, generosity, the ability to, to try to pull that off for the next three years. And oh, it's very, very exciting. I was not aware of that. So talk to me. Let's, let's credit where credit is due. New York Community Trust is uh, supporting? They are, yeah. We went to them with this idea kind of as a lark, and they were as or more excited about it than we were. Um, and so they came in with really a remarkable commitment for what is, um, we think, a pretty unique approach, at least at a local level, 
right. um, in New York City anyway. And, uh, yeah, they're backing us big time. It, it would not be possible with that. Um, now, uh, let's talk very specifically. So the first story is already in the can. It's already out. Uh, this was uh, by our buddy Marlene uh, Peralta. Um, so why don't you mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about what that story is? And, and I'm going to put you on the spot. My Spanish is terrible, and I did terrible in it in school also. Uh, do you know how to say city limits in, Sp in Espanol? Uh, well, it's funny. It's uh, technically it's uh, uh, ciudad de limitant limites. Okay. Um, so, but we're calling this project uh, city limits in Espanol, <laughs> una ciudad uh, sin sin limites, which means a city without limits. Because Good. we think to some degree this is about pushing beyond limits. Marlene's story was about the fact that aging immigrants, especially Latinos face unique challenges. We've been covering aging for several months at city limits, and we wanted to see the overlap between being an older New Yorker and also being someone who has either not citizenship or not uh, no papers at all. How does that complicate, you know, getting older in the city and surviving? And so right. she took a, a good look at that, which was great because it shows how this, this intersects with stuff we've already covered and will allow us to just zero in on where the rubber really meets the road on, on some of these issues. Well, as usual, right, uh, right there on uh, the cutting edge. So then, um, what, what are we? So aside from that one story, I guess what are we going to see, and when are we going to see it? Will, will we have a separate website to look at? Let's let's mm -hmm. really uh, explain to people so they know where to find it and how sure. to access it. So everything will still be at citylimits.org for the time being. Uh, we'll be hiring a full-time reporter, I believe, in September, um, and so the content will start coming. We're going to start a newsletter and perhaps a WhatsApp feature that will allow us to disseminate this news, and it will be both the news that we do as well as aggregating stuff that El Diario and other excellent outlets wow. still do produce um, in efforts to pr produce and provide resources to ways for people to interact with the city. Um, eventually, we will have a basically a mirror site that uh, displays this content and also allows people to tap into other elements of city limits. Uh, we're going for a redesign now that will achieve that and other things. So. A lot of changes for now. Everything will be on the site, but uh, increasingly there will be more and more content in Spanish. And those Spanish stories will then be translated into English so we can all get a sense of what wow. different sides of New York are, are looking and seeing and feeling. And that's, that's a big part of it. You know, it's different languages, but it's one, one city. And I think speaking in Spanish doesn't uh, divide our readership. If anything, we hope it's going to make it uh, larger and, and richer. Jared, I want to uh, thank you personally uh, for um, you know taking the leadership on this. Maybe others will uh, uh, you know uh, follow suit. And um, uh, you know, I know both you and I agree that uh, we're both serious about the work that we do. We're both serious about making sure. I know BronxNet really cares a lot about people of all cultures in our home borough of the Bronx. I think this is just a great thing. I congratulate you, and uh, we're looking you. forward to wrapping our arms around everybody and bringing them all together. And that's what, uh, to me, that's what this is an attempt at. So congrats. We're looking forward to more and more great stuff from citylimits.org. Gary, I'll say gracias, mi hermano. <laughs> en español. Uh, Jarrett, uh, 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 ciao. <laughs> That's Italian. <laughs> Arrivederci. Thank Arrivederci, you, whatever it is. All right, be well. All right, there you go. Thank you so much. What a fun show this evening. We uh, spoke to uh, Lois Hard down at the border, uh, down there with the migrants, and then also uh, really about change in media. If you talk about the Bronx buzz in this program being about media, uh, we really got you know a look at the future, maybe a look at the future of Bronx media. So um, uh, that's it. I guess that's all we're doing. Uh, Monday night we'll have Bronx Talk, usually at 9 o'clock. I, I can't tell you yet what we're going to do. We're still working on it, uh, but we'll see you then. Good night.